So thank you so much for inviting me. It's always such a pleasure to talk to the product community. Um, I'm so grateful that there is a product community. When I started doing this 10, 11 years ago, it's just a bunch of us flailing desperately on our own and uh, wondering if we are doing everything wrong. And now we get to flail desperately together and wonder if we're doing everything wrong together, which I promise is vastly preferable to <laughs> having these conversations with ourselves. So I'm gonna to start today by, by telling you a story. And it is the story of my worst day as a product manager. I think we always have a lot to learn from our challenging experiences. And this was a very challenging experience, which left me very angry at other people for a finite period of time, and then reflective about my own actions afterwards. So uh, I'm gonna leave this slide blank for dramatic effect as I tell you this story about my worst day as a product manager. So cut back to about 10 years ago, I was working as a product manager at a company which had multiple lines of business, and I was tasked with creating a unified roadmap that would bring these lines of business together. Now, this was not easy because we had stakeholders for each line of business who had very different visions for where the product and the company were going. So to my credit, I took the time to really get out ahead of that. I met with each person individually. Each time I met with a stakeholder, I took some of their feedback on the spot and I started updating the vision, updating the roadmap, making sure everybody felt accountable to it. About a month into this, I had my big presentation with the leadership team and I walked everyone through, here's what we talked about, here's what we're gonna do, here's what you all said. And it was fine. It wasn't the explosion of praise and celebration that I had hoped for. Everyone kind of said, yeah, we know this, you already told us this. Okay, go ahead, go do it. So I was a little deflated in the moment, but you know, okay. People seem to be on board with this. A couple of days later, I get an email from our CEO that says, Matt, I couldn't help but notice that you seemed a little deflated in that meeting. You're such a creative person. And I know you have such a great vision for the product. Why don't you come back to our meeting next week and present to us your creative wildcard vision, not the consensus driven safe roadmap, but what's your take on where we should go? And I read this email and I said, heck yeah. This is awesome. I'm going to go in there. I'm going to show them just what a great product thinker I am. So I put together my big presentation. I go in the next week and I say, all right, everybody. It's time. It's Matt LeMay time. It's time for you to see my brave and bold vision for the product. And one executive in the room turns to me and says, Matt, I'm, I'm confused. We were all bought into what you presented last week. Um, why, what happened? Why are you presenting something else? And I started to freeze up a little in the moment. And I said, well, you know, I kind of looked at the CEO and I said, I, I, I just wanted to present a more creative vision because I got the sense that that last one was maybe, you know, not as exciting as you all wanted. And that executive kind of goes, okay. A second executive turns to me and says, yeah, Matt, I'm, I'm a little confused here. You know, we were all bought in. We talked about this a month ago. I thought it was really good. What's, what's the problem? And I grab onto my chair and I go, um, well, you know, I, I heard the CEO told me that I should really, you know, that I, I have permission and, I, and he told me to do this and make this a really awesome new presentation for, for, for our new vision for the product. Finally, a third executive turns to me and goes, Matt, what the hell? Like, why, why are you doing this? Like, we were all fine with this. And I, again, dug in and I said, uh, well, you know, the CEO, you know, you, you told me to, to do this. So I, I was waiting for the CEO to jump in and say, yes, I told Matt to do this. He's right. Um, some of you may have guessed that's not what happened. The CEO looked around, saw that the worm had turned and said, Matt, I didn't, I didn't ask you to do this. What the, what, what are you doing? And I sat there with my hands up in this kind of expression, tears streaming down my face while I could tell everybody in the room uh, turned against me. This was the worst day of my life as a product manager. And it might feel a little nightmarishly familiar to some of you. 
So as we often do, I went about for years after this talking about the horrible leadership team I worked with and how they set me up and betrayed me in this dramatic way. But as I grew up in my product practice a little bit and in my personal life, I hope, I started thinking back to some of those moments. I'm wondering, was this also my mistake? I could go on for hours about all the mistakes I made in this scenario, right? From going back on hard won consensus to springing a new surprise idea on executives in a meeting. But the moment I keep going back to in my mind is that first moment when that first executive said, what are you doing? Because I was given an out. I could have read the room and said, oh, you know what? Yeah, this probably, I made a mistake. It's all good. Move on with your agenda. Happy to be here. And my worst day would have been just a pretty regular bad day. The biggest mistake I made amidst all my mistakes was the mistake of getting defensive, of digging in and saying, no, this is the right thing. I was told to do this. I'm doing the right thing rather than just letting it go. So when I started thinking about putting together a talk on defensiveness, I Googled definition of defensiveness as one does and had one of those funny moments where Googling the definition of a word proves strangely revelatory. Um, our dictionary definition of defensiveness is the quality of being anxious to challenge or avoid criticism. And for those of you who work in product, uh, this definition might be reading you to filth as I felt it was reading me to filth. Product management can all can leave us all feeling anxious and defensive. Uh, that feeling of I am anxious because there is criticism coming my way uh, is kind of the water we swim in as product managers and as designers, engineers, anybody doing this kind of cross-functional product work. It's one of the hardest truths of product work that product work makes us defensive and defensiveness makes everything worse. This talk is called How Defensiveness Kills Collaboration, but it really could be called Defensiveness Ruins Everything. So I wanna ask you for a quick, honest gut reaction reflection. When was the last time you felt or acted defensive in your product work? The last time you felt that anxiety and felt that sense of, I need to defend the decision I made or I need to shut down this criticism I am receiving. When's the last time, last week? Thank you for your kind words about my story. This week, I hope that my mistakes and bad feelings can help some of you. Uh, oh, a large feature demonstration, yep. Yeah, to be clear, um, my answer is also this week. We're, we can't get rid of this feeling of defensiveness. I'm not here to tell you that you will achieve a state of zen-like indifference to the constant challenges you receive as product people. I'm here to help you understand how defensiveness does harm and to share some of the tips and techniques I've used to avoid making mistakes in those moments. Yeah, no zen, no zen makers Pilates, unfortunately. Um, I've been managing to conjure 10 minutes on an exercise bicycle every day grudgingly, and it still has not made me a less anxious and high-strung person. So no, no Zen Pilates, unfortunately. So as I started reflecting on this, it was tough for me to look at all the different moments and times that defensiveness had made things worse. It was also tough for me to unpack how much harm I had done in moments where I felt that somebody else had wronged me. I see we have a question in the chat. Why did the CEO put you in this situation? And I think the answer is that the CEO was trying to do a good job. He did see that I was deflated. So he opened up a conversation to make sure that I felt good about the work I was doing. Then when he presented that to the group, he saw that the group was getting upset about that and he didn't wanna lose the trust of his executive team. I understand it. Most people do harm because they're trying to do a good job. That's one of the other really tough things about this work. 
And in my attempts to do a good job, there were three main categories of defensiveness I could document, all of which had harmed the very thing I was trying to defend. Um, I think in this case, the CEO was probably trying to defend me and it wound up doing harm to me. So in my attempts to defend my contributions, my decisions and my team, I had made my contributions, my decisions and my team worse. I had harmed the things I was trying to defend. So let's talk about my attempts to defend my contributions. As product people, our contributions are often pretty ethereal, ephemeral. We aren't always the person who wrote the code, who did the design. We, as Adam said, often exist in this strange connective space of decision-making. And sometimes we're tempted to point to the things we did and say, look, I wrote that spec, I made that decision. I did this, see, I'm valuable, that's what I do. You need me, I'm helpful. But looking back on it, every time I've tried to defend my individual contributions, I was distracting my team and my organization from our actual goals and objectives. We are not in the business of writing product specs. We're not in the business of doing these intermediate deliverables that product managers often do. We are in the business of trying to deliver value to our customers and our business. And just about every time I tried to draw attention to my individual contributions, I made those contributions less valuable. That's something I think we can all kind of get on board with, right? We're in the business of delivering value, outcomes over outputs, or as Adam thoughtfully pointed out, our outputs should be systematized and in service of our outcomes. But as we go through these three categories, they get a little trickier, I think. My attempts to defend my decisions meant that I was shutting out important new information that could improve the quality of my team's work. When I would go into meetings saying, I'm gonna defend my decision, oftentimes when people were challenging or criticizing my decision, they were actually exposing me to new information that could help make that decision better. When they said, what about this thing? What about that thing? And I said, no, I was right. This thing and that thing might've been really critical information for me and for my team. And the second I dug in and tried to defend, defend my decision, uh, my decisions got worse. And here's the trickiest one. My attempts to defend my team meant that I was insulating my team from changes in company level goals and objectives. And this never ends well. We've all been there when our team is hard at work on something and we start hearing rumblings of, maybe you should be working on this other thing. What if you do this other thing? And I think we sometimes have a tendency to feel like our job is to defend our team from people who might be asking too much of our team or who we perceive might be asking too much of our team or changing their mind in a way which would make things difficult for our team. In my book, Product Management and Practice, I have a subchapter, which is my favorite subchapter in the book called, Our Boss is an Idiot, or Congratulations, You've Ruined Your Team. And this is based on my own experience of trying to build camaraderie and cohesion on my team. Honestly, trying to get my team to like me a little bit more by blaming executives, by saying they're trying to get us to do this, but don't worry, I'm going to dig in and make sure that we stay the course and do what we're trying to do. The problem is sometimes those executives have access to information I don't have access to. This gets particularly bad when I've tried to defend my teams against any accountability to the business at all. When I've said, don't worry, if the engineers wanna work on this thing, I'll make sure you have room to work on that. And if executives come to me with objectives and KPIs, I'm gonna say, don't worry about it. We got it, we got this. So that hasn't worked, right? Eventually your team is gonna be held accountable to what you're delivering for the business. And your attempts to spare your team from that will ultimately come back and harm not just yourself, but It'll harm your team too. I've done a lot of harm to my team in the name of trying to defend and protect my team. So to briefly summarize, defensiveness makes everything worse and product management can often make us defensive. Ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba, end of talk. Um, <laughs> this is one of the hardest things about this kind of work. Huzzah, product management, exactly. So um, let's talk about what we can do. And again, this is, tough, emotional, reflective stuff. There's no one weird trick to never get defensive as product managers. And again, 
I still get defensive all the time. That feeling of being defensive, that tension, that tightly wound feeling doesn't go away. But as Adam said, that tension often means that we're doing our most important work. When we feel challenged, when we feel uncertain, that's often when we're actually doing the most important and the most valuable work for our team and for our business. So I wanna share with you some of the tools and techniques that I've used to try to turn that defensiveness away from digging in more towards opening up so that we can take advantage of that tension, of that uncertainty and do our best work even when it's really challenging and difficult and uncomfortable. So my first tip, always present multiple options and avoid yes, no conversations and decisions. This is part of how we avoid that confirmation bias. If you go in trying to get a yes or trying to get a no, you are gonna dig in. I did an exercise with a team I coach a while ago where I had one person present one option to another product manager playing executive and another person present multiple options. And it was just wild to see how different these things played out. It's very easy to poke holes in one option, to say, what about this? What about that? What about this other thing? But when you present multiple options, you're using the weight of the hippo to move things forward. That push to make a decision to look at things as trade-offs actually helps those strong opinions move us forward. So I found it really helpful to avoid yes, no conversations and decisions all the time. Um, I know oftentimes we're told that as product managers, we need to get great at saying no, but the best product managers I've worked with never say no. They say, all right, well, here's what we're trying to accomplish. If you have a new idea, how does that align with our goals? Maybe that makes things better. Maybe the thing you're bringing to my team is actually better than the thing we're doing. Let's look at our goals, let's look at our options and let's make the best decision. And you will be shocked at how quickly this person who you perceive as personally victimizing you is just trying to do a good job. It's just trying to do the right thing. Oftentimes they don't understand why you've prioritized the thing you've prioritized. And once they do, they feel great about it because they can go off and tell the people who are asking them those questions why you're doing what you're doing. If you can get out of yes, no dynamics, present everything as an option, present everything as a trade-off, that gets you 50% of the way to not having to dig into that, yes, I'm right, or no, you're wrong. This next one does feel a little bit like one weird trick. Product managers hate this person who's always able to do this thing, but um, I swear it works. Get in the habit of saying, okay, great, and then thinking about what to say next. <laughs> if you're in those meetings where you suddenly feel challenged or you suddenly feel unsure, um, I try to rather than going, um, or, well, I, I just go, okay, great. Um, and then I will either say, I don't know, um, I'm going to do some research and come back to you next week. Or I say, okay, great. Let's talk about that a little bit. Give me a little bit more detail on, on why you think that's a good idea. But that initial, okay, great reaction is a dissipation of challenging energy. If you don't let yourself get into a head-to-head -head battle with a hippo, you are not going to be uh, trampled to death by a hippo. If you embrace this and open yourself up to any challenge you're given, any question you're asked, um, just that little move of, okay, great, really works. Um, and over time, you actually kind of start to believe it too. You start to feel great saying, okay, great. Um, it's a little kind of, brain hack that I've found has gotten me out of some really, really challenging situations in my life. This last one um, is probably the one that I've had the most success with in the last year. So the last big mistake I made was I got some information that made me feel like maybe I had done something wrong. And in that moment of feeling like I had done something wrong, I went and messaged a whole group and said, um, this thing, ah, oh, this thing, yes, very good, this thing. And I got a few messages from people the next day that were like, where the hell did that come from? That was a weird message and it felt like you weren't listening to us. And they were right, I wasn't listening to them. I was panicking. So 
I've started giving myself a 24 hour buffer for any actions that feel defensive or reaction reactive. Anytime I'm like, oh no, I made a mistake. I better do this. Or, oh, is this person mad at me? I better go see if they're mad at me. I give myself a 24 hour buffer. So I'm gonna ask you, when was the last time you acted out of defensiveness or reactiveness and then regretted it the next day? When's the next time you sent that Slack message like, um, really don't appreciate that comment you made in the meeting yesterday. Um, I thought we were aligned. And then the next day you see the response and you're like, oh crap, why did I do that? I've got to deal with this. Um, yeah, I, 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 I feel for all, all of you on this one. Um, I'll share with you, <laughs> what I've started doing. Um, I literally have a notepad on my desk. That's a picture of my desk that I took this morning. See, here's the notepad. And I will just write down something on a sheet of paper. If again, I feel like I should do something that feels reactive or defensive. And the next morning I will look at the note I left to myself and Nine times out of 10, I'll say, why did I care about this? <laughs> why did I think this was a big deal? This is not a big deal. This is not something anybody will care about in the harsh light of mourning. So I have found it very helpful to just jot down a little note to myself. And again, nine times out of 10, whatever I was that stressed about in the moment, I can just let it go. So my big takeaway from this, I hope that as you start reflecting on how defensiveness has factored into your product practice, you can start to have this moment, which I am still navigating, of realizing that so many of our worst days as product managers are largely of our own making. We go from bad days to worst days because we dig in, because we try to defend things when we should be opening up and listening. So that's my talk. I have one more quick thing for you. Um, I mentioned my book, Product Management and Practice. I am not gonna go into a, a whole book spiel, but I am very happy to share with you uh, for the first time, in fact, that Product Management and Practice is going into a revised and expanded edition, which I am starting work on this week. So if you've read the book and you have any feedback, if there are any particular topics you'd like to read more about in a book about product management, um, I typoed my own email address here. So it is matt at suddencompass.com or matt at mattlemay.com. Um, or find me on Twitter at Matt LeMay or send me a LinkedIn request. But if you have any suggestions for the book or for product management books in general, things you'd like to read more about, I would be so grateful to hear those. So that is my spiel about defensiveness and product management. I hope you found this helpful. I appreciate your feedback and the conversation in the chat enormously. And I'm looking forward to answering any questions you may have. That's awesome, Matt. Really appreciate the time um, sharing. We'll give people a moment to open any kind of stuff they want to ask as questions in the Q&A. Um, you know, I've got a ridiculously well-worn edition of your product management practice book. Um, and, uh, can't describe how uh, water damaged and everything else it is from the, the, the various usages of people's desks and things like that. But uh, one of the things that really stood out for me in your book uh, is really kind of far, far, far in the later chapter of the book. And I'm going to kind of paraphrase it here because I'm going to try to read along a bit. It's like, uh, you know, when you really feel like you're kind of the only person keeping your team or organization from falling apart, take a step back. And I think you talked a little bit about some of the different techniques we can do to, to, to take that kind of step back. One of the things you note in here is making a list of the things you can't control, delegating those impactful things, uh, impactful work to colleagues, and making sure you're protecting your team's most valuable routines and rituals. Um, I'm, I'm curious, like, uh, in the interactions that you've had with teams, how, how maybe some of those kinds of qualities have showed up in helping you, I guess, address the defensiveness part of things as well. Yeah, I think there's a tendency in product management. Almost every product manager I knew has had one moment of feeling like they're carrying the weight of the world, that they're the only thing standing between their team and oblivion or their company and oblivion. Um, product managers tend to fall into a victim martyr complex pretty easily. I know I certainly do. That's something I've been working on in my professional life and in therapy. And 
I think, again, in our attempt to defend and protect our team, we often take on a lot of stuff ourselves. Don't worry, team. I'll take care of this. Don't worry. I'll make this happen. Don't worry. I'll do this for you. But oftentimes it's when we delegate those things that we really give our team space to shine. Um, we can't insulate our team from the realities of the situation we're in. And I found that when the teams I work with have had an open conversation about what are the things we can control, what's the important work for us to do together, and how do we enlist everybody in doing that work, um, product managers often wind up having this kind of paradoxical twofold reaction where on the one hand, they go, wow, my team is so awesome. On the other hand, they go, oh, I kind of thought that I was the special person who could solve everything and do everything myself. And maybe I'm not, maybe I'm just part of a team. Um, and that maybe I'm just part of a team feeling um, is actually one of the best feelings you can have as a product manager. When you start realizing that you're not tasked with being the special magical savior of all things, but just a person on the team trying to do a good job. Um, it helps you see everyone else that you work with as a person on a team trying to do a good job. And uh, that's a big weight off for everybody. Yeah, that's great perspective, great perspective. I'm gonna uh, kind of paraphrase one of the questions that we've got from people today here. How do you navigate a situation where you have a particular team member always countering your ideas and inputs even before listening and digesting them? Yeah, so that's a, that's a, a tough one. Um, there are people who like to be contrarian, um, people who take great pleasure in being contrarian. Again, I found that presenting multiple options is sometimes really helpful. I'll sometimes even kind of scrum poker style, ask my team, like, we got three options, A, B, and C. Everybody hold up the one they like the most. So, uh, you know, are there people who might respond to that by saying, none of them? Sure. But when you have that kind of dynamic in a group setting, again, when you start breaking out of this person is challenging me, which is an intrinsically oppositional dynamic, and more to this person that's holding up the progress of the team, that puts a different kind of social pressure on somebody. Um, it's very hard when you're deadlocked with somebody, especially somebody who enjoys being deadlocked to move things forward. But when you present this not as this person is opposing my ideas, but rather this person is holding up the team from making a decision. If three other people on your team are all really excited about something and one person on your team is trying to stop you from doing anything, that pressure works very differently when it's social pressure coming from the entire team versus when you yourself are locked in a battle of wills with one other person. Um, anytime you can just opt out of that battle of wills um, and find a way to reframe this as a group team decision based in our desire to achieve a shared goal or outcome, um, I found that really helpful. Cool. And one last question I'm going to ask is I know we're both musicians. Um, yes. We've got this, and you've got a much bigger arsenal of guitars than I ever would ever do. But curious how music and the nature of like improv and the interactions that you bring when you play with a band have kind of translated maybe into your interactions and how you play with people. It's funny because I'm bad at improv. Um, I am not a fun person to jam with. When I was, to give you a sense of just how true that is, when I was in a, a professional band some 15 years ago, my four bandmates all started a band without me, which was just the four of them. And when I asked them why, they said, well, we like to have fun sometimes. And I did not take offense at that. I think if anything, what I learned from being in a band was that when you try to control things too tightly, um, you miss out on your ability to do your best work. My journey as a musician was the journey of learning that sometimes if I let my band brainstorm without me, they would actually come up with better stuff. Some of the best parts of our second record were because I told my band at a certain point, you know what, here's a demo. You all go play it and let's see what you come up with. Um, yeah. Letting go of control makes things better. And I wish I had known that earlier in my career as both a product manager and a musician. But as I have uh, come to let go, I think the quality of my work has improved dramatically. I hope so anyhow. No, that's awesome. Um, thank you very, very much for everything today. It was really super insightful talk, uh, really interesting. I know a lot of people had a lot of great comments along the way, and uh, uh, we're, we're looking forward to you know, being able to show this one out with people uh, after the event, too, for anybody that uh, weren't able to make it uh, today and, and attend. Um, we're going to shift you over from being a uh, co-host to being an attendee, and we'll get Dan Olson set up next, who's our last session of the day. Uh, again, thank you very much for uh, for everything. Thank you.
And as a reminder too, if you're found today helpful, we also have another great event coming up in October on how to run product to scale, which is our product excellence summit here at product board and I encourage you to check that out as well. There's information as well on the uh, product makers community for that.